Welcome back, Time Crunch fans. I'm Coach Adam Pulford, your host here on the Time Crunch Cyclist Podcast. Zone two. It's a, it's fascinating that so many people are are so into it, and it's so popular right now. And, and on one hand, I, I'm glad it's getting the notoriety it deserves because it's it is important. But on the other, I'm seeing so much confusion, misinformation, and questions about it, which makes me want to spend more time on it on the podcast discussing it. In fact, I'm I'm just back after a few weeks in Spain where we had our CTS Fall Classic Camp in Mallorca, of which our main focus was Zone 2 base miles and volume. (laughs) Not a bad place to do it. Uh, We do these camps at this time period in the season, so this is November when I'm uh, just before Thanksgiving when I'm recording this and we do this to set our athletes up for a good next season. So if you have early season events like Trans Andes, Cape Epic, or early springtime local races, um, it's good to log some miles like that uh, late in the season in in the previous year. I guess if you didn't know CTS does camps like that, well, now you do. Uh, If you're curious, head over to trainright.com and click on camps and you'll see um, our whole camp calendar for 2024. It's it's all there for you. We have our go-to climbing camps around the U.S., which are shorter, focused on climbing and descending. And then we have our bigger camps like I just did um, in Mallorca. And these are more destination location camps with uh, kind of a volume based approach, or sometimes we do race or event um, specific stuff like SBT gravel camps and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, if you're curious and you're up for a little bike adventure, go check it out. Okay, <laughs> sorry for the shameless plug. Now back to our episode. Uh, during my trip there, I had a lot of good conversation with athletes at the dinner table um, while we're riding, uh, you know, out there on the roads. And we were talking about all things training, bikes, nutrition, zone two in cadence work, especially. (laughs) Then I ran into a good friend uh, super randomly out on the road, a good friend that used to live in Colorado Springs. His name's Michael Weiss, and he's a pro triathlete and coach. Um, We talked and, and we had a good time to, to reconnect. We talked about how aerobic training is really what everybody's talking about, how it applies to fitness and performance, and how these two things can be similar, yet different at the same time. Okay, finally, uh, all of you, all of you listeners have been blowing up our Instagram, Facebook, YouTube feeds with awesome questions, comments, and curiosities about this topic. I give you all this like lead in (laughs) because today we're going to talk about all of that and we're going to answer some of your questions as well as uh talk about some of the reflections i have on this topic all with the aim of bringing this thing back to practical aspects of training for zone two and all zones so here we go (laughs) first one uh is a reflection okay I, i considered a reflection because it's it's kind of a compilation of all this stuff that we we're talking about and, and um, uh, the past three episodes that we've had, if you missed them, go back and check it out because it, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is in relation to that, which is uh, me talking with uh, CTS coach Renee about lab testing um, and how it applies to LT1, LT2. I'm not going to get into that right now. Go back and watch them if you didn't. Some of the stuff will make sense that I'm talking about. However, you can you can um, keep on listening and, and still soak up a lot of the information. So this is a reflection on um, some of that. And in a conversation I had with an athlete while I was on the bike, um, this is what we talked about, and this is what they said. It seems like the common advice is just do as as much zone two training as you can, then go out and race, and you'll have good performance. Is that true? What are your thoughts? Oh boy. Those are my thoughts. (laughs) But I, so I can see where, you know, a a lot of the take home message for people listening to podcasts, reading articles right now, that can be a very uh, valid take home message. However, that's not, that's not what we're saying. And let me clarify, this wouldn't be my first approach to just do a bunch of zone two training Um, and then go do bike racing, okay, or do your event or whatever it is, because you'll be lacking durability and specificity of racing if you only do zone two training, okay, or just one zone for that matter. If all you do is zone three, you'll be lacking things, okay? So you'll probably be 
good late in the game <laughs> if you do you know 20 hours of zone 2 training or or uh, something like that but you'll you'll be missing those anaerobic elements to it okay you'll likely get shelled out the back you'll miss the move uh you won't have the legs when it's time to go okay so in an ideal world you need to do all the intensities you need to do all the zones in your training okay and that's super super important when it comes to having the performance uh and having uh say as much fun as possible when you're out there doing events now this reflection is a bit similar to a question uh that i saw on youtube so here here's that question thanks for an interesting episode I'm a recreational athlete doing pretty much 100% training in zone one slash zone two and have been during the last two years. So this guy, he's been doing all of his training in this uh, aerobic uh, training zone. Okay. And his question is, am I missing something important by not going above zone two, running, cycling, cross country skiing uh, for about seven to 10 hours per week? And this is coming from at Dunder Call on YouTube. Okay. So my initial response goes to this. Okay. Because my view is that fitness and performance, they can be similar, but they are two separate things. What I mean by that is you can have a bunch of fitness, but lack performance. Meanwhile, for endurance sport, you will likely not have great performance if you lack fitness. So these two they coalesce together. They, they dance together and you need one to get the other. Okay. But don't think that if you just have a bunch of fitness, then you will have performance. They're, they're, they're different. Okay. And yeah, a lot of people can disagree with me on this, but my view of it is that fitness is more aerobic and general based performance is more specific and has more anaerobic contribution to that. Okay. So if all you do is zone one to two, it's fine, especially if fitness and health is your goal. When you want specific performance, like I was just discussing, more intensity is needed. Now, Renee actually answered this question on YouTube and in the comment section. If you go to, I think it was uh, our third episode on this. So if you want to go over and I'll, I'll link to this in the show notes too, if you want to read more of it. But I mean, Renee's awesome. That's why we did three podcasts together on this topic. And I'm just going to go ahead and read her response because it was solid and there's nothing more that I could probably say on it. So here's Renee's response to uh, Dunder Call's uh, question. It really depends on your goals. Many of the athletes we train are interested in improved performance. That's our CTS athlete clientele. And that could be preparing for an event, keeping up to the group rides, or even just being able to power up the hills. In that context to improving overall performance, then it is necessary to progress from base training into higher zones, just like I was saying before. Training in the higher zones trains glycolytic capacity. That is the ability to use carbohydrate for fuel and would result in improving maximal sustainable power at FTP and peak aerobic capacity. However, if the goal is just wellness and overall metabolic health, sticking to the predominantly low level zone one to two activity is fine in that regard. So if you haven't checked out our YouTube channel, a uh, small plug for that, head over there, subscribe to the CTS channel and chime in on the conversation. Many time crunched athletes have great comments and, and good questions and probably some similar questions to some of our listeners here. And um, that's another uh, avenue and another community that you can plug into there. But again, like, yeah, you need all zones if you, if you want to maximize kind of the full potential of fitness and performance. And that's a good way to think about it. Okay. Fitness is the base of everything that we do from an aerobic standpoint. Performance is that anaerobic contribution, um, in the way that we make our power and how much power can we produce. So, um, fitness and performance, my goal with this is to have you think about it in, in a couple different ways. They are similar, but they're separate. All right, let's get on to point number three. And this is a question. This is a question from uh, another, yeah, another time crunched athlete on YouTube. Should I take from this episode that zone two riding is likely more beneficial, generally speaking, when number one, done at the lower end of zone two range, and number two, when sugary fuels are more restricted or avoided on these rides? And this is coming from Mountain Music on YouTube. 
So again, R Renee did um, have a great response on this. Go check it out if, if you want to um, read that more because there's a couple other responses to that. But with most athletes I work with, they target the upper end of the zone, <laughs> no matter what zone it is, thinking that more is better. So if I prescribe uh, zone two work, uh, which is 60 to 76% of FTP, a lot of people will just ride at 76% thinking that that is best. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, if I target, uh, if we're doing zone four training or threshold training, which is 91 to 105% of FTP, they're going to ride right at 105% and thinking that that is best. More is better. That's not the case. Um, more is not always better. Um, in fact, I would say the opposite is more true more often. And so when we're talking about back to zone two training, I'll encourage many of you just like we talked about in the past three episodes, hug the lower end of the range. Okay. So it is better done at the low end. Yes. Why? Because what well, we talked about improving fat as a fuel source, as well as not accumulating as much fatigue as you would up at 76%. And when we're doing base training with the goal of burning fat as fuel, hugging the low end. Yes, this is better. Okay. So Renee, her, her answer is, uh, 60 to 70% of FTP. And I think that that is very appropriate because it still gives you a range, right. Uh, to kind of hug and, 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 um, give you some lateral, some ups and downs, because we know when we're pedaling, when we're just riding our bike, you know, it's not just straight and it shouldn't be just straight across. If you're doing, if you're riding inside, sure. If you're outside, not as much. So give yourself a little bit of that wiggle room, but hug the low end. And that's, that's definitely going to, um, be far better than plugging the upper end. Okay. Now, as far as to your question, uh, mountain music on when sugary fuels are more restricted or avoided on these rides for the benefit, um, yes and no. Okay. There's a time and place for sugar. Sugar is great. First of all, there's nothing wrong with sugar. Okay. So the reason why we keep on talking about carbohydrate and, or sugary fuels, right. In, in this regard, it, it pertains back to burning fat as a fuel source. And this will go into my next reflection. Okay. So let me just answer that part two with this reflection. Cause I was on a ride. <laughs> I, I, I think this could have been an email submission or on the socials or something like that. But the, the basic sentiment was, so you're suggesting to do all zone, zone two rides fasted and not take in sugar. If I want to burn fat as fuel, not really our point. Okay. What we said in the podcast is if you are a sugar burner, one way to change that is to go do your endurance rides that are two hours or less with no carbohydrate intake. Okay. So it's not fasted and I'll get to that point here in a minute. So, but to know whether you are a sugar burner or not, you actually need to measure that. And the only way to measure that is to go do a lab test like Renee and I were talking about. Okay. So either way, the action is still the same, which means that if you're doing endurance rides, especially in base training mode of two hours and less, your, your need for fuel intake is not as important because you're not burning through as much sugar or glycogen as you would for harder rides or longer rides. Okay. So as long as you take in electrolytes and water, you stay hydrated on these endurance rides, you have enough fuel on board in your muscle glycogen, your liver glycogen to get through that, especially if you're eating normally. Okay. You're not restricting carbohydrate in your normal diet. Okay. So uh, mountain music back to your avoiding, uh, sugary fuels. The primary mechanism is, is just, you know, related more to that fat oxidation. If you want to burn fat as a fuel source, or if you want to change yourself from a sugar burner to more of a fat burner, this is what we're talking about. And over time, if you do this, you can help your body burn more fat as a fuel source or, uh, gain more metabolic flexibility as we, we talked about, um, in that episode, a couple caveats there. I, I said, uh, you know, non-fasted, I, I I'm still telling my athletes to eat breakfast, then go out and do their endurance rides. So they're not fasted when they do this. They're just, they're going out and training and, and not guzzling sport drink for a ride that's two hours and less. That That's what we're talking about. Now, on this point, if you do fasted rides, 
It's a slippery slope. <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm actually really hesitant to to talk about this on such a short episode and kind of like this question answer sort of thing, but I'll 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 do it. Because there there's something called training low and and training low has some benefit, but be par- be careful here, like I said, this is um a slippery sort of conversation. Training low doesn't pertain to some sort of altitude training. It refers to low carbohydrate availability. And I should probably do a podcast on this, and maybe I will, um, to get the full scope of things. But it's a complicated topic with a lot of nuance. I've included in a link to further reading um, and research on this from Asker Zhukenrup, who I think is the best expert on this, as well as many nutrition topics. But the core concepts of training low or restricting carbohydrate intake for a time period in your training season, okay, the core concepts of this is to reduce carbohydrate intake. Uh, And you can do this just by simply eating less carbohydrates throughout the day or doing fasted rides like we talked about, long rides with no carbohydrate intake or even gasp. Don't consume any carbohydrates in your post-ride recovery window and there could be potential beneficial adaptations to be had there with your body sensing less glycogen on board, say on your human, right? And this increases a stress response and thus potentially forming some adaptations against this. So I'm cautious to recommend this on this sort of platform because you can definitely get yourself into a hole of fatigue with this. And when you're that restrictive on carbohydrate intake, even if you're doing base miles, you'll, you'll, you'll keep on kind of digging that hole. Okay. That that's what I mean by that. Just keep on, um, less and less muscle glycogen that's available. And it's your body still needs glycogen. Your brain actually runs exclusively on glucose, which is broken down through glycogen. So even from a at rest metabolic process, like you can get yourself into trouble by not taking on carbohydrate. So again, my, my word of advice on this topic is don't do it really. (laughs) There's a way that you can kind of turn down carbohydrate intake, especially during uh, training and maybe reduce it a little bit in life during base, but don't, don't go extreme because man, you you can really um, cause a lot of problems with this. Okay. I guess I would only recommend this if you're already sleeping and training with good habits, you have ideal body composition and you have already maximized your tra- your available training time. And if you have someone like a good coach or a nutritionist in your corner to measure, monitor, and consult with on a regular basis. So there's a lot of like things that I, and I, I really do not do this with any of my athletes, um, the exception of like a couple that we've tried over time. I've seen training low go sideways pretty quick for some athletes. And, um, usually that cost of it is not worth it relative to the benefit that we can get from high quality training, recovery, and sleep along with adequate nutrition to meet the demands of training. So for most of us listening, takeaway here is, um, as discussed on previous episodes where we are in base mode, when intensity is not high, you don't need all the high carbohydrate intake that we had during racing season. Okay. We can do two hours or less of endurance riding in our training sessions with reduced carbohydrate intake or just electrolytes stay hydrated. You can dial down the carbohydrate in your general diet. And if you have identified yourself or tested as a sugar burner, this is what I would recommend to do. So a moderate approach to carbohydrate intake and a kind of reduction of it for your endurance rides in order to get metabolically efficient or metabolically flexible once again. So training low, I don't recommend. Adjusting or dialing down carbohydrate intake during low intensity time periods is my advice. So that, that's my reflection and response to the answer there, Mountain Music. Um, I, I kind of went a little bit deeper than the conversation that was uh, on YouTube, but I definitely wanted to answer that because it is a con- it's confusing, right? And even as I was <laughs> going through there, I had, I had to circle around a couple of times. So, uh, all right, fifth and final question, and then we'll wrap this thing up. When doing zone two base training, what is the repercussion of going into zone three to four for very short time periods, like to get over a hill or something like that? And does that sabotage your workout session? 
Second question, is it better, more efficient for base fitness improvement to go under zone two or over zone two for short periods in base training session? And that's coming from uh, Kenny Drug. So great question comes out, comes up often. And my answer is this, if 90% of your time on your ride is spent in that zone two endurance power distribution zone, you're good to go. What that means is a little spikes over some coasting below, or maybe a little bit of zone three to four, just to get up a short hill. You're all good. It won't ruin anything. Okay. Another thing I tell my athletes is to simply focus on the perceived effort for the day. Perceived effort for endurance rides should feel like a four or five out of 10 on the rate of perceived effort or RPE scale. What that means is 10 is a max effort. Okay. One is I'm just super, super chill mode at the coffee shop <laughs> you know, before you even start pedaling. Okay. So four or five right in the middle all day, maybe a few periods of that six to get up and over that hill focus on perceived effort, and then check your ride afterwards, making sure that 90% of the time is spent in zone two. Good to go. Now, if you're, I'll say this, if you're sprinting out of stoplights, going hard and attacking over the hills and thinking hard is better, or, at, you know, <laughs> pegging it at 76% of FTP, that's too hard. That's not zone two training. And you're going to turn on, flip on those anaerobic um, switches that will get you away from fat burning and get you away from the goal of zone two training. Okay. Cause keep in mind aerobic base training with the intent of increased fat oxidation, which means your ability to burn fat as fuel, as we just talked about requires you to stay around that LT one, which is 60 to 75% of FTP. So increasing time at zone three and above starts to get away from that goal. So don't focus on those surges. Don't focus on like, how much can I do above that? Just simply focus on staying in zone two. Don't worry so much if it's just a short spike here or there, and then you can check your data uh, afterwards. Because keep in mind, I've said this so many times on the podcast, but human physiology is not super, super duper precise. Okay. Those little spikes, it, it won't add up to much so long as you're not intentionally doing it. But if, if your um, terrain around your house and um, where you live is eliciting you to do that over and over, and you're finding in your, in your data that you're accumulating much more time in those higher zones, well, <laughs> now you need to start to probably change your approach. I'll say this, consider doing more of your zone two training inside. If you do live in a very hilly place or in a, a location that has a bunch of stop lights and stop signs or you just have this like start and stop, um, approach to your riding. Okay. All right. In summary, zone two training is, is very, very popular right now, but there's nothing new under the sun in the benefits that it gives athletes. I love that it's popular right now. Stuff cycles back around numerous times over and over. And right now zone two is back in the limelight and I'm a big fan of it, but, uh, just get away from the misinformation and know that we need all, all intensities, right? So to prepare best for races and events with that specific performance, that's what I mean by we need all zones. You need anaerobic and you need aerobic training to maximize your full potential and your performance, as well as maximize the fun factor when you go out and race your bike, improving your ability to burn fat as fuel does require you to stay around that LT1 or in your zone two endurance training to improve this and restricting some carbohydrate intake on short -er endurance rides can help with that. But I wouldn't recommend going into training low practices without having someone to consult with and to kind of measure, quantify and bounce ideas off. So if you want more reading about that, I've linked to that as well as some aerobic training articles in our uh, landing page below. You can find that at trainright.com. Click on podcast and uh, check out the latest episode that you're listening to here for those resources. Meanwhile, if some of these questions and reflections have spurred on more questions on your end, you can go to that same location, click on ask a training question, and you can submit any question you want over to us at CTS that gets di sent directly to me, and I will do my best to answer it on an upcoming episode. So thanks again for listening. Thank you again for all the questions and blowing us up on socials. Uh, keep doing that. It's, it's pretty fun to hear from you and answer all of these questions. 
get out there and keep training.